Hi, I'm Mars Berry. I work at the University of Roehampton, training the next generation of outstanding teachers, which is tremendously good fun. 18 years before that, across four different schools, much of the time as a primary ICT coordinator, three years as a primary head teacher, hence prematurely grey hair, Roehampton let me out to do other interesting things, one of which has been working with British Computer Society and Microsoft to produce these quick start guides, which Irene asked me to talk about this morning. So let me tell you more of the story of that, and then we'll have a look at some of what we've got in the, the new quick start guide. So really, this was about professional development. As Simon said earlier, you know, if we want high quality computing happening in our schools, that essentially demands that there be a high quality computing teacher in all of our schools. Interview with an unnamed official in South Korea, quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. To improve an education system, you need to improve the quality of those who are working in that education system. Two ways of doing that, in, improve the quality of people who are coming into the profession, that takes a long time to filter through, or, t or alternatively, do all you can to make the people who are already in the profession as skilled, as knowledgeable, as effective as they can be as teachers. Well, that's a little bit insulting, Mars. Well, perhaps, and forgive me if it is, Computing is different, though, because computing is the only subject we put onto the English curriculum where teachers didn't have any background in the subject that we were expecting them to teach. So there's a particular challenge when it comes to computing. Very, very similar sentiments from the folks in America, the CS for All consortium. Hardest part of getting great computer science in every school is getting a great computer science teacher in every school. John Hattie, who's done the, the, the authoritative um, pulling together of all of these meta-analyses of educational research, the biggest effect, the thing that makes most difference to the quality of education is when students, sorry, when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own teachers. The second point is a really important one. If you can devolve some of the responsibility for what happens in your classroom for learning to the learners themselves, that's got to be a successful thing. Yeah, They're the ones who can take responsibility for their learning, but when we get better and better at what we do, that has a demonstrable impact on what happens in school, on the effectiveness of an education system. Mishra and Kola have this TPAC model for what professional development around technology education really ought to encompass. And they start with this usual combination of pedagogical knowledge and content knowledge. That in order to teach well, you have to know the stuff that you are teaching. Yes, you can be sort of, I am merely a guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. But actually, it really makes a difference if teachers do know what they're talking about. And secondly, that teachers should be effective at communicating those ideas. In our realm, it also seems to matter that they know how to use technology, that just knowing the subject content, just knowing how to teach isn't on its own enough, that the use of technology seems to matter. It's very similar to Simon's sort of, um, you know, how to be an effective computing teacher with that technology thing. So, how do we get outstanding computing? Three components to that. Pedagogy, being able to teach it well. Tech skills, being able to use the technology well yourself as a teacher and computer science knowledge. And if we have those three together, then we reckon that produces something approaching outstanding teaching of computing. For Barefoot, which others are talking about, and for Quick Start, we took the view that these two we weren't going to worry about. The teachers, broadly speaking, know already how to teach, so we don't need to cover that. The teachers, by and large, okay, there are exceptions, we know, are not bad at using technology to get their job done. But the real challenge for computing education was the computer science subject knowledge, that many, many of those who are teaching the subject don't have a background in computer science, don't have a background in software engineering. They kind of picked it up as they've gone along. So we focused, for both Barefoot and Quick Start, with that bit there, the computer science knowledge. Um, <coughs> because subject knowledge really does matter, Rob Coe, who I was talking about in the Quantum Project, says the most effective teachers have deep knowledge of the subjects that they teach. When teachers' knowledge falls below a certain level, significant impediment to students' learning. How do you get better at your job? Learn the subject that you're teaching, inside out, be authoritative when it comes to that subject. The teaching agency back in England asked us to put together recommendations 
for what a newly qualified teacher of computer science should know about computer science. And so we produced this sort of set of recommendations for both primary and secondary. And this document has guided a lot of what we've done with professional development projects around computer science education. The list there is, I think, a useful one. When I look at my own students at Roehampton, we make them do these audit when they start the course with us. And they grade themselves. There's, there's no test involved, but they just assess themselves in terms of skills using a range of software. It shouldn't come as any surprise to you, but what is that? That's 90% of new Roehampton students say they are either proficient or expert at using email, that 80% of them regard themselves as proficient or expert at using social software, and so on at the top of the list. Where it gets interesting, though, is the bottom of the list. These are, if we'll allow the term, digital natives, but they have less, about 20% of them, who claim to be proficient or expert when it comes to working with video. You just thought that was, you know, a skill you could expect 18 year olds to have, but it appears not. They've spent a lot of the previous 18 years watching video, but very rarely making video themselves. You know, we do the thing in the lecture. How many of you have got a YouTube account? Every hand in the room goes up. How many of you watch YouTube in the last week? Pretty much every hand in the room goes up. How many of you have made a video and uploaded it to YouTube? We get some, but it's a minority pursuit. It's like an English curriculum that was always about reading and write, reading and never included any writing, or always about listening and never included any speaking. They don't do databases. They've never been allowed to use the interactive whiteboard whilst at school themselves. They don't have much experience of data logging. And crucially for us, in terms of teaching computer science education, I've got, you know, 1% who claim to be expert in programming. I have over half, nearly three-fifths of my students, who say they have no knowledge of programming. And in the case of my PGCE students, I've got a year to turn them around and go and teach programming to primary school children themselves, okay? And how much time do you think we get for computing education inside the Roehampton PGCE? Um, when we ask them about their knowledge, it's an even more depressing picture, I'm afraid to say. So skills actually, by and large, that's not too bad if you see it as across the whole range there. Their knowledge of computing, much, much lower. So, you know, Things like secu security is actually top of the list there. That's the one where they scored themselves highest. Knowledge of how the internet works. Knowledge of how search engines work, which is on the English national, primary national curriculum for computing. I've got 1% who say that they're expert in that. I have, what is that? That's about two-thirds of my students who say their understanding of search engines is not very limited or only basic. They have all used Google but they have no real idea of how Google works. How does Google work? You type the word in, click the button. <laughs> it's magic, or it might as well be magic, okay? My favorite one of all is the logical reasoning one, because they have, like, half of my students say they have never used logical reasoning, which is really, ever since, like, how did you choose the course? Is it like just random guessing or whatever? You get a similar figure when you ask head teachers about logical reasoning. It's really quite disturbing. So. Here's my challenge. How do, and, you know, I don't think Roehampton students are particularly weak here, okay? I don't think that's because you know, the Roehampton students are selecting people who don't have any logical reasoning. I think generally you will find this with school leavers, or those, you know, in the case of our postgraduates, these are people who've already got a degree. Generally, you will find beginning teachers will have a not dissimilar profile of knowledge, understanding, and tech skills. So there is a challenge there, I think. But we're meeting the challenge. Barefoot computing, which I was delighted to hear more than 50% of Northern Ireland primary schools have, have joined in with, they commissioned the survey. It's not just about barefoot this. So when YouGov did the survey in 2014, before the introduction of the computing curriculum, 33% of teachers in England were confident with the computing curriculum. By last summer, 81% of Great Britain teachers said they were confident with teaching computing. And that's a huge, that's a massive increase there, okay? We could, it's so big an increase, then we, we kind of have to dispute whether those figures are reliable or not. But part of the picture, part of what we tried to do is this notion of the professional development pack. So the first quick starts, quick start, uh, primary quick start, secondary, were designed as the thing for the CAS master teacher, forgive the term, or the CAS hub leader, the shrink-wrapped professional development materials. There's the book, 
And there's a CD-ROM. Everybody remember CD-ROMs? <laughs> <laughs> when we had before the, the, the cloud. There's a CD-ROM of PowerPoints, which the hub leader, the master teacher, could use as an introductory set of, of professional development twilights for the teachers in the schools that they were supporting. Funded uh, jointly by Microsoft and the Department for Education in England, Quickstart Computing, important national programme, have all computing teachers confidently, oh, split infinitive by Nicky Morgan, to confidently plan, teach, and assess the new computing curriculum. Value the funding that Microsoft has provided. Essential that we work in partnership with both industry and teacher networks. So you've got that sort of big society thing, forgive me, going on there of central government plus industry plus the community, teachers working together to produce and use these resources. So pleased to see that SIA had taken that content under the terms of the Open Government Licence, perfectly legitimate for them to do so, and spun that up into a guide to computing at school for Northern Ireland teachers working in post-primary. So in there, in this lovely new, what is it, Northern Ireland Curriculum Guide for Post-Primary Schools, you've got most, you've got the content from the primary version of Quick Start, together with the stuff which my colleague Pete Kemp wrote for this guide for secondary teachers for computing in the national curriculum, and some of the stuff which Mark Dawling put together for the secondary version of Quick Start, Quick Start 2 as I call it, and that's combined together, together with some introduction and context information, which makes sense of this in the different education system which you have here. So I would commend that to you, free download off their website. If you're not entirely satisfied, they will refund the fee in full. Okay, but we had a similar challenge in England. So lovely as the stuff which we put into Quick Start Secondary was it was focused much more on the pedagogic challenges. How do you plan computing? How do you go about assessing it? Rather than the subject knowledge. I think at the time, the feeling was primary is where the biggest challenge is for subject knowledge. In secondary, we don't have to worry about subject knowledge because secondary teachers are all experts. And it turns out, yes, they are all experts, but they're not all expert in computer science and yet are expected to teach all of this computer science. And so for secondary, it turned out that we'd not necessarily done the wrong thing, but we needed to do something else as well. So we needed to do the, like the primary was focused on subject knowledge, and do that in the context of secondary too. So to, to attack the, or to cover our key stage three curriculum, and thus you get that this, which I said to Bill Merchant, yeah, of course, I'd be happy to edit the primary so that it makes sense for secondary and then realised what I'd agreed to take on at that point, that this was a significantly larger understanding than I'd initially thought it was. Hopefully you've got a copy of that in your delegate pack. If it's not there, then go and pick one up from the side of the, 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 the room where the tea and coffee is. Um, I think Irene just wanted me to talk to you a little about what we've put in there. You have your using ICT, desirable features, which covers a number of the programming strands there. And that's key stage three of the Northern Ireland national curriculum, and we've got that. So this hasn't been written with, the, with your curriculum in view. It has, though, been written with Key Stage 3 of the English computing curriculum in view. And I think there's enough overlap between what we're expecting to, what teachers are expected to teach to students in England with what's covered by this interpretation of the Northern Ireland using ICT curriculum that it's relevant for those of you who want to improve your computing provision at Key Stage 3, so that it would then lead into some really quite impressive performance in the digital technology or the computing strand of the digital technology qualification up at Key Stage 4. Six chapters to it computational thinking, programming, systems, computer networks, productivity and creativity, safe and responsible use. I know that kind of means that there's four sixths, two thirds of the book is all around the computer science bit, but that's really where the subject knowledge gap seemed biggest in terms of the English curriculum. Generally, English teachers are pretty good at the old style ICT, let's make something, let's be productive, let's you know, use the office skills, let's use our digital creativity skills. Generally pretty good at teaching students how to keep themselves safe and act responsibly online. So the focus is very much on the new stuff, the computer science bits. So what have we got in there? Computational thinking. We take as a starting point Jeanette Wing's definition of this, that computational thinking 
the thought processes involved in formulating problems and their solutions so that the solutions can be effectively carried out by what she called an information processing agent. I would have used the term computer there, but she has in the back of her mind that this needn't be a computer that's carrying out the instructions. It can be people, it can be ant colonies, it can be cellular organisms who are in some sense carrying out this way of this solution to the problem. Key thing about this though is that it's the way you look at the problem, the way we as people, not the machine, the way we look at the problem, the way we look at the system so that the solution could be automated. In general, anytime you're using a computer, it's a two-step process. Firstly, how are you going to solve the problem? Secondly, make the machine do most of the work for you there. Putting together a set of presentation slides. Firstly, what's the story you want to tell? How are you going to sequence that? What are the me what's the media that you're going to draw on? Then, and typically only then, actually use PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever to, to, to tell that story. Similarly with computing or computer programming. Firstly, how are you going to solve the problem? Then write some code to do that. We'll come back to that later. For Barefoot, we took this, I think, still think, really nice approach to, to unpacking computational thinking, Jeanette Wing's very, very succinct description of it there, into a way of thinking about computational thinking for teachers. So we said, looking at problems, looking at systems in this sort of way, draws on a number of concepts and also draws on a number of approaches. So the concepts on the left-hand side there, we use logic. We reason about why something does what it does. We use logic to discover mistakes in why something doesn't do what it should. We evaluate whether the solution that we've produced is fit for purpose. We think of the sequence of steps, the set of rules to get something done. We solve general classes of problems by looking for patterns rather than individual problems uh, one at a time. We decompose big problems into smaller parts. Um, yeah, I still have doubts about removing. Abstraction is more about managing complexity rather than just removing the detail. It's a way of putting inside a black box the detail that we can worry about or somebody else is worried about for us. All of those make sense in the context of computing in its broadest terms. Anytime you're going to be using a computer to help you get a job done, you're likely to be drawing on some or all of those concepts there. And so teaching those concepts, making students aware of those concepts, giving them practice with those concepts, matters when it comes to using a computer well. Not just for programming, okay? All of these things are going to make sense in all sorts of different contexts. And I think this gives us a reason for including computing in a curriculum. But which profession, which sphere of endeavor doesn't make use of computers? If you want to use a computer well, Think about the problem the right way. You can go a bit further than that if you want to. You can say, actually, all of these things apply in other contexts too. If we're going to put on a school musical, then we're going to do some of these things. We're going to think of the sequence of steps. We might call it the script, okay? We're also going to take this big problem and break it down into smaller parts. We're going to manage the complexity. I can't learn their lines for them. They've got to learn the lines themselves. We abstract the detail of learning lines so that each individual cast member does that. So you can apply these things in other contexts far removed from the world of computing. You can probably learn these things in other contexts far removed from the world of computing. The tone of equivocation in my voice is necessary because... I'm pretty certain that doing these things well makes you better at programming. And I'm pretty certain that doing these things well makes you better at using a computer in more general ways. I am less sure that doing these things well makes you a better cook or a better musical producer or better at tiling your kitchen floor. It might, okay? It won't do any harm, but the evidence is weaker for that you can apply these across the whole of life. Yeah? You can apply these to using computers really well. Applying these to the whole of life, possibly. But, you know, do me the randomized control trial study. You know, show me that children who have been taught computational thinking do better when it comes to other domains of life. And then I'll be more convinced. The other side of it is the approaches. So as well as these concepts, there are particular approaches to working with these things that seem to help. Tinkering, playing, experimenting. 
creating things, learning through making things to show to others, fixing things when they go wrong, keeping going when things get hard, and yes, working together, not during controlled assessment, I hasten to add there, okay? So you have a number of approaches. They apply in software engineering, they apply in computing, they apply in other areas too, of course they do, okay? And Burford, I think, is, gives us a nice framework for that. We've adopted that framework. So we have in there logic. One example of, Boole of logic is Boolean logic, and Google are kind of hide away the Boolean search operators, but if you want to get good at working with Boolean logic, don't just go to Google's homepage. Go to the Google Advanced Search page and start thinking of exactly what results you want. You want all of these words. You want any of these words. In Boolean terms, that's an or, an and operator. This is an or operator. None of these words obviously, is a not operator. It's introducing these ideas of Boolean logic in a context with which many of our learners are already very familiar. Then, of course, we've got the algorithm thing, Python code, and I'm sorry that many of you don't speak Python, but it's reasonably easy to, to, to figure out what's going on there. I'll give you a moment to read through the code, and then if one of you could volunteer and say, I think it does that, that would be lovely. Go for it. It's an analogy on track seven. If the number is, is correct, then you obviously get the um, one is your guess, the two is your guess, the two or two high, and there's a simple sort of scoring system that you can find it on. Shall we have a go? See what it does? How confident are you with your prediction using logical reasoning? Predict the behavior of simple programs. I'm using uh, Python. I'm using an interface to that called Jupyter, which is a web browser based interface to the Python that runs on my computer. So yes, it's a web browser, but it's not using the internet to do this. It lets me do this sort of thing inside a web browser. Oops, sometimes. Shift click. Yeah, OK. So I can make this a little bit bigger so you can see it a little more comfortably. Here we go. So the program is running now. I'm thinking, the computer says, I'm thinking of a number between 0 and 127. We've got the challenge of guessing. What's your guess? 56. That's too low. Say again. 75. Still too low. 100. Too low. One, two, one. Too high. Why did you choose 110 out of interest? Yeah, that's a good strategy, that, isn't it? Too high. 105. Too high. Hold on, before we, before we get there, what can you tell me about my number now? It's between 100 and 105. Inclusive, exclusive. Can't be 100, can't be 105. We've got four numbers. Four numbers it could still be, I think, okay? And you're going for 103, you say? Too low. We don't even need to play the game now, do we? But we should just finish this off. Yay! Okay, so how many goes did that take? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Should have been able to get there in seven goes, yeah? If we'd started with that strategy, is it 64? then uh, to do the math in my head now, 96, then whatever it is. We halved at each stage. It should only take seven goes to get there. And you get a really nice pattern between your yes, no answers and the binary representation of the eventual number as it happens. We call this binary search if you do it this way. What you didn't do, and I'm delighted by it, is linear search because that would have taken up most of the talk. What? Okay, or not, as the case may, may be. Okay, naught is too low, one. Uh, two, three, four, five. We'd eventually get there, yes. But it would be a really, really unpleasant experience for all of us, yes? Ignoring the information would also have been an unpleasant experience, yeah? So we've got two different search algorithms. And one of the things which we talk about in Quick Start is the difference between binary search, this really efficient divide and conquer approach, and this divide and conquer idea of applying the same thing to a smaller and smaller set of possible numbers is something which we use a lot throughout Beth, throughout Quick Start, rather, and generally in computing. Um, full slide view. Okay, that's the one. Other examples. Then we have the sort algorithms. So if we give uh, children here 
live in New Zealand, I need to apologise. New Zealand children work much, much quicker than children in the UK do. Watch. Let's see what I mean. Computers often have to sort lists into order, sometimes alphabetically, by date, or some other value. Usually computers can only compare two values at a time. We're going to simulate this by using balance scales to make the comparison. Each container is a different weight, and you need to use the scales to compare them. One approach to sorting them from lightest to heaviest is to find the heaviest one first. This is done by comparing each container with the heaviest one so far. After all the containers have been compared, we have found the heaviest container. We then do this again to select the heaviest from the remaining containers. This builds up our sorted list one item at a time. The list is finally sorted after 55 comparisons. A faster way is to pick a container at random and split the collection into two groups, those that are lighter on the left and the heavier ones on the right. Now all we need to do is sort the two groups. We can do this by using the same method on each group. Pick a container at random and split its group into two parts. The process continues in the same way. Any unsorted group is split into two groups until there's only one container in a group. A single container is already sorted. This method might seem tricky, but it only needed 27 comparisons. That's why it's called quick sort. For more information about this... Anybody tried that? It's such a lovely activity. The way I do it with students at Roehampton is I just give them the baby food pots. Can't find film spool cans anymore, but baby food pots with different numbers of batteries or sand inside, sort these into order. Don't sort them into order. Think of a way to sort them into order. That's the thing about computational thinking. It's not so much solving the problem as thinking of finding a systematic way to solve the problem. And then, you know, test it out, show it to the other students in the room. I think over the last five, six years, we've had, I think, four students who've come up with quicksort for themselves without ever having seen it before, which is hugely impressive. Tony Hall got a fellowship with the Royal Society, essentially, for coming up with that way of sorting numbers back in 1961. My students aren't quite so uh, well rewarded for their work. Any maths teachers in the room? It's fine. Okay. Sivarastosthenes. No? Okay. So, prime numbers. Lots and lots of territory here around finding whether a number is prime. Get your students to come up with a way to check whether a number is prime. Better still, get them to come up with a way of finding all of the prime numbers in a list. This is a classic algorithm for this. Okay. So, we know one isn't prime, so I'm going to ignore that. Two is prime, so I'm going to keep that on my list. But then I'm going to get rid of all of the multiples of two, because they can't be prime because, well, 2 goes into them. And I can find multiples of 2 relatively easily because it's just every second number there. Um, so 2 on from those, we lose those, 2 on from those, lose those, lose those, lose those. Okay, so that's all the multiples of 2 removed from my list apart from 2 itself. 3 isn't a multiple of 2, so it must be a prime number. But the multiples of 3 can't be. So anything which is a multiple of 3 I need to get rid of. So bang goes 9, 15, 21. You can call out, you know, you could help here. 33, 39. You've got to watch out in case I miss one because that's very easy to do. I should be wearing my spectacles at this point. Um, 69. Okay. Remember all of the even multiples of 3 have already gone. 75, 81, 87, 93, and 99. So that's all the multiples of 2 gone, all the multiples of 3 gone. 5 must be prime because 2 doesn't go into it, 3 doesn't go into it. But all the multiples of 5 can't be prime, so they can go as well. 7 must be prime, but multiples of 7 can't be prime, so we keep 7 and then get rid of any multiples of 7, of which there are very few left. 49, 77, 
77, that would have been 84, 91 needs to go as well, which is an easy one to avoid. And once I've done that, everything left is a prime number. I don't even need to check beyond 10, because if something goes into it then, it needs to be a smaller number that went into it as well. So everything left is a prime number. And that's a very, very efficient way of finding all of the prime numbers up to and including a particular number, I think. There may be mistakes. I don't think there are any mistakes in there. But again, coming up with a systematic way of doing this, called Severo Sosthenes. Other aspects of computational thinking, we've got the decomposition thing as well. So can you solve a problem by breaking it down into smaller parts? Here's a picture for you, typical turtle graphics crystal flower thing. What can you tell me about the program to make this picture? How would you get a turtle to draw that? Yep. And then tuck it inside the tiger block so it draws the square but then rotates slightly. How many Before times does it rotate slightly? How, how many degrees does it how, what angle does it rotate it slightly? You're spot on. This is made up of some uh, of a number of squares, isn't it? Yeah? And decomposing this picture into well, there are squares there that have been turned around. It's absolutely fabulous. Can we just, you know, finish this off? What how many squares have we got? What angle must it be? Yeah, okay, so we've solved it, yeah? Giving your students something like this to do, reverse engineer this. What program must I have written to produce this? Uh, a little segue into um, compression, which is also there in Quick Start. To represent that as a bitmap as it is at the moment, loads and loads of bits required in order to do that. To represent this as a program, very, very short bit of text code to program a logo turtle or a python turtle to draw this. Then we get into territory, I think it's called Kolmogorov complexity. The complexity of a picture is the shortest possible explanation you could give for how to draw the picture there, or the shortest possible explanation of a thing is, is measure, a measure of its complexity. As well as the computational thinking, how you think of the problem, we also, of course, include programming. And for me, Programming is algorithms plus code. So programming itself is a two-step process. How are you going to solve the problem? What is the algorithm? What are the sequence of steps? What's the set of rules? And then express that in the language which the machine can follow. You're not going to follow it yourself. You're going to get a machine to do this. Can you have one without the other? Of course you can. Yeah. So if you do the, you know, the lovely sandwich bot thing, what's your algorithm for making a jam sandwich? Absolutely fine. Lovely way of illustrating the importance of a sequence of steps to get something done. But you try making that into a computer program. Good luck to you for that. Yeah. Because even if we did have a robot kitchen, you don't program the robot kitchen that way. If you have a robot kitchen, you program the robot kitchen by showing it what to do. And it watches what you do and does exactly the same thing. Can you have code without the algorithm? Yeah, HTML, great example. Yeah? We have a language which the computer can understand for how to make a web page, but we can't implement an algorithm just in HTML. You can't write me an HTML which will add numbers together or sort numbers into order or you know, play that sort of um, you know, guess, the, guess the number game. Yeah? But other general purpose programming languages, Turing complete programming languages, you can do. So generally when teaching programming, how are you going to solve the problem and then write that as code? Do you have to write your algorithm down? No. Do you have to draw it as a flowchart? No. Do you have to use pseudocode? No, of course you don't. You've got to have an idea of how you're going to solve it. And you might at times need to communicate that idea to somebody else, and thus flowchart, including examiners, and thus flowcharts and pseudocode come into the picture there. But don't get hang, hung up on pseudocode. Exam boards and people use pseudocode in two quite different ways. People writing pseudocode for other people will use general informal language to express how they're going to solve the problem. Exam boards use a very tightly specified pseudocode so that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet, but then translate that program into code. We have a number of constructs that we cover in the programming chapter, which I think is the largest in the quick start guide. So we talk about sequence, we talk about selection, if then statements, we talk about repetition, doing things a number of times or until something happens. We talk in key stage three quick start, not in the primary, about modularity. So we're talking about procedures, we're talking about functions. I talk about classes and objects at that point, but I don't dwell on them. And we talk about data structures. Key stage two, we talk about variables. This broadens out into lists. 
And I think we even get graphs and, and, and um, higher order, sorry, and arrays when we're talking about data structures. Programming languages matter. And I'm generally of the view that it's best to teach one language well or two languages well than to give learners an experience of lots and lots and lots of different languages. The data on that is, is weak. But from what we kind of know, it seems that your higher ability, if you'll allow me to the term ability, students will cope with a multiple language approach. That They'll actually quite enjoy seeing Java and C compared, or seeing Python and uh, Ruby compared to solve the same problem. But your weaker students need to be able to express themselves with a degree of fluency in one language well. And thus, focusing on one language seems to be the best thing to do when it comes to entitlement. Having said that one language matters, actually, for most of Quick Start, I'm using two languages at the same time. I'm illustrating things using a block-based language, such as lovely Scratch, such as Snap, which is like the extension of Scratch. I describe Snap as... Snap is to scratch as Mycroft is to Sherlock. It's far, far more sophisticated, but hardly anybody's heard of it, which is a great shame. And then we have a text-based language there. I'm using Python for that. You might want to use Objective C, sorry, you might want to use C sharp here if you're aiming for the GCSE specifications two years further down the line. I don't speak C sharp, so can't really speak about that authoritatively. So for most of the programs in Quick Start, there are illustration, illustrative examples in both, in either Scratch or Snap and Python. So you can compare the two ways of doing this. It's not so much how it is expressed in code, but that it is expressed in code. The algorithm helps, but yeah, you want to actually have it doing something. Here's a program for you. This one is in Scratch. Can somebody you know, have a look at the code on the screen there, tell me what it does. Spot on. Okay, we need a bit more detail from you. What can you tell me about the random numbers? Somebody else, please. Both of them between one and twelve. And what can you tell? And will it do? How many times will it do this? Okay. Ten times. Absolutely. Is it keeping track of the score? <coughs> no, it could have done that. Yeah. Okay. So very well done. Okay. Notice, please, none of you typed that into Scratch and saw what it would do. Okay. You reasoned logically about that, and that matters when it comes to teaching programming. Don't merely say, copy this in and make it work, okay? Think about it. The thinking about it is really, really important. Being able to predict what code does matters much more than being able to type code in, okay? In terms of being able to learn from this. Same program in Python. There you go. I could have put them in the other order. You'd have got the same answer. I'm sure you'd have got the same answer. It's not that difficult when you put it into Python compared to putting it into Scratch. And you know, I hope you can see where one translates into the other. It's exactly the same algorithm, just expressed in two different ways. Why am I illustrating it with this? This program shows us what we mean by sequence, selection, repetition, and variables, OK, which is an element of data structures here. No modularity in here, apart from the random integer um, function call that we're making from a library there. So we have a number of instructions that we follow in order. You got that, folks. You really did. We do this 10 times. You spotted that yourselves. And what happens if we get the answer right? It says, well done. If we get the answer wrong, it says, think again. Yeah. So we've got selection going in here as well. So those first three constructs, sequence, selection, repetition, a program as simple as this one or the Scratch equivalent covers that. Yeah. If your learners can do that at the end of, I don't know, year seven or whatever, then they're well on track for getting to a, a, you know, a good end point when it comes to GCSE, I would suggest. Um, yeah. OK, we have other illustrations as well. The modularity thing is harder, but it's well worth persevering with this. Okay, So sequence selection repetition, cover by the end of primary, if I were you, introduce modularity later. It's this idea of abstracting the detail of this. So how do you convert a decimal number to binary? It doesn't so much matter. Create me a function which will do that reliably, and that's great. There are loads of ways of doing that. This is one example on the board written in both Snap and Python. Why is this snap rather than scratch? 
Is there Montreal Ivy in Scratch as well? Yeah, you can build a block in Scratch. So the little purple blocks, you can create a new block which does something. Okay, which is fine. Scratch 1.4 didn't do that. Scratch 2 brings that to the party. But what it doesn't do is have this report thing in there. So Scratch does procedures. You can create a thing which draws a square, and that's fine. Scratch is deliberately sort of, you know, hobbling itself to make it accessible to any primary age child, in my view, yeah? Snap allows us to create a function which returns the answer. And from a point of view of abstraction, that's tremendously powerful. Because what I want is a function which will convert a decimal number into a binary number. How it does that inside the function, any recipe which does that reliably, is fine by me. Really it is, okay? So I can change this and still, produce, still use this in my program in a reliable way. As long as it does decimal to binary conversion, the internal working of the function is immaterial. Almost immaterial. Some things will be faster than others. Let's have a look at it working. Okay, again, using um, Jupiter for this, let's clear all of the output. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Okay, so we have that function there, convert 127 from binary to decimal. Anybody know, sorry, other way around, decimal to binary. Anybody know the binary for 127? Thank you. Eight ones? Seven ones. Okay, I'm expecting seven ones. Let's have a look. Oh, no. What's it done? Oh, because I didn't actually initialize the function. All right. Don't do live demos of code. Okay, and there you go. That should be seven ones in there. Once we've done that, we can use that. So here we have, using functional programming idea called map, we're applying this decimal to binary conversion thing for all the numbers in the range naught up to but not including 10. And we get that out as an answer there. So that's counting in binary for you in one line of code, which I think is quite elegant. And then our drill and practice maths game, we can now make this a binary test. So let's not do 10 questions because life is too short. Shift click here. What's the binary equivalent of 77? <laughs> okay, 64. No 32s, no 16s, an 8, uh, 4, no twos and a one, maybe. Yes, okay, I'm not gonna do two more, all right? But do you see the lovely idea about the function, the modularity there? That I could have put an entirely different function in as long as it did decimal to binary conversion, and I could have used this in my drill and practice maths game here just as effectively. We manage the complexity of how to convert it and just use that. And of course, Python has a built-in function for converting decimal to binary, which is probably much better than the one I'd written there, but it doesn't illustrate the point so well. Okay, recursion we get to as well. So we have here, building on this idea of modularity, a function which calls itself. So this is the scratch code, equivalent Python code on the right hand side there. We define a tree as made up of two smaller trees. It's like broccoli. Broccoli? Broccoli. Did I say broccoli? Broccoli, okay. If you look at a lump of broccoli, it's made up of smaller lumps of broccoli, yeah? All the way down. Broccoli is made up of more and more broccoli. So we can take this code. This is scratch with a little bit of luck. See inside the code. Okay, and there's my tree function. You know, a tree of bigger, if it, the tree gets to smaller than three units on the scratch screen, then we're going to stop. But for trees bigger than that, one tree is made up of one smaller tree turned with another smaller tree. So we should see something emerge when we run the code. Oh, and there's an instruction to run this in turbo mode. There we go, which gives us that. Isn't that just gorgeous? Yeah? Recursively defined. Do you remember that thing about Kolmogorov complexity? Writing a program to do that, very, very small number of scratch blocks. Drawing that by hand, you know, or producing the bitmap of that, much more complicated. You can play with the code as well, of course, and, you know, do you teach recursion or do you just let them learn recursion? We don't talk about pedagogy, but try this one for size. 90 degrees there, 0.7 I'm going to leave, 180 degrees there, 0.7 here, and 90 degrees here. And again, you know, draw what you think it's going to be or try and describe what it's going to be. I'm just going to run the code and we'll see. Isn't that just gorgeous? Make that a little bit larger for you. Change this scale number here. Run the code again. I just think that's just so elegant. Okay, I need to get out more. Um, okay, he's got the recursion. So we talked about quick start, uh, quick sort and quick start. 
earlier. You know, remember the, the, the girl who did the, you know, this is heavier, this is lighter. We can do that as code as well. And yes, if you're going to teach them the algorithm for thick salt, or for selection salt, or for bottle salt, let them code it as well. And the quick sort algorithm expressed as, as snap code, very, very simple, just like the girl was doing, okay? How's your quick sort of list? Well, you make, essentially, you make three things here. You have the pivot, which could easily just be the first thing in your original list. On the left-hand side, we have the things that are smaller than that pivot. On the right-hand side, we have the things which are bigger than that pivot, yeah? What do we do with this, the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right? We apply quick sort to it, divide and conquer. Sort the stuff on the left, sort the stuff on the right, and make sure the pivot stays in the middle position there. It's a recursively defined algorithm. There's a subtlety if you look out for it. If you try and do this from memory, okay, of sort things on the left, sort things on the right, and make sure the middle stays in the middle, you forget this bit here. That if you have more than one of the things the same, you need to have a greater than or equal to or a less than or equal to or all the things that match the pivot in the middle there. You've got to watch out for that edge case. Same thing in Python. Incredibly short program to do that really sophisticated way of sorting numbers. And we kind of need to just test that that works. Here's the, here's the Python code. Again, Jupyter Notebook. So define quick sort and then quick sort those numbers into order. And we get, surprisingly enough, the list back of the numbers in order. And it will work with other lists of numbers. It's not just set up as specialist so as to pass with that one, yeah? And being able to express that idea of quick sort as code, I think, is a really important part of the process. Oh, yes, okay, debugging. So the programs that they... Software engineers get... The stuff which we put into the English computing curriculum has annoyed some folks in the software engineering domain because they think we're teaching students, pupils, to make mistakes in their programming, because we put a great deal of emphasis on students who use logical reasoning to correct, to detect and correct the errors in the programs that they write. And you can't do that unless they make mistakes in the programs that they write. So the software engineering community, some of whom say, don't, you should never have to debug a program, you should write perfect code. Good luck with that, okay? <laughs> Say that we're teaching it all wrong by teaching students that they have to make mistakes. And sometimes exam specifications make the same mistake. In order to get the high grade, you have to show how you corrected a mistake in your code. You have to have made a mistake in order to get the maximum grade in some exam specifications. It's a weird thing somehow. Okay, so here's some buggy code. Um, again, I've made the mistake of assuming everybody in the room speaks Python, which may not be the case. Anybody see something that's wrong with this code? Let's have to practice maths code again. Okay, so what, I'm, what we're trying to do here is concatenate a string what is with an integer a, and it should crash at that point, shouldn't it? Should complain. I can't combine a string with an integer, so we take that integer a and cast it as a string. Well spotted, sir. Anything else wrong with this? Yeah, print well as object. Yep. Needs to be as a string. Thank you. Anything else? I do. Is that just a lucky guess by looking at the syntax? Well done. Okay. Anything else? Yes, you do. I'm not going to fix that now because it's really interesting seeing how it goes wrong. Okay, but thank you. Well spotted. Really well spotted. Okay. Um, anything else wrong? Yes! So well done. I'm going to leave that in there as well because that's often one which you don't, you know, if all you do is follow the, me the error messages, neither of those come up in response to error messages. Most of the rest will. Shall we run the code now and see what, what the interpreter says when we try it? Okay, there is some more to find, okay. Some of which is just me being sneaky. So you get this sort of error message back. Okay, the stuff so far, brilliant. 
Get your students doing that. Don't let them just run it first. Get them reading it and trying to spot them out the errors by logical reasoning, not simply by responding to the error messages generated. So this actually is reasonably helpful. You've got all of this code shown here. It's highlighting where the error is. Import error, no module named random. Okay, and my mistake is simply using a capital R for random. Okay, so shift click runs the code again. Name error. Okay, for i in range 10. Oh, okay. Name 10 is not defined. What's going on there? Okay, this is just me being really mean and using a lowercase l rather than a number one. Okay, <laughs> don't do that. Okay, it's, it's really, you know, you don't want to annoy them that much. Okay, yes, it worked. Rejoice, okay? The, there's no errors left. It runs perfectly. We can go home, submit it to the examiner. I've finished my homework, Miss Sir, okay? What is nine times nine? Let's just, you know, see. Watch it working. 81. Oh. Okay, and that's because it's comparing string 81 with the number 81. It's the thing in the multiple choice test earlier. So you're right, we need to convert that to an integer to make the comparison. Shift click. Okay, oops. Okay, why is this? Okay. Okay, I may have made a mistake at some point here. Okay, I'm not going to fix this now because I can't see where I've gone wrong. Okay, here it comes. What is 3 times 7? 21. Yes! What is 3 times 7? 21. What are the chances of this, hey? Same question three times in a row. Okay, at which point we realize that we're, cast, we're choosing the random integers in the wrong place, and that should be happening inside the loop. Like there, that's gotta be indented the same way. Okay, I'm struggling to get a response from this. Kernel, at least start and clear output. There's something weird go okay, what is one times one? Five times nine, forty-five. And so on. let's get one wrong just to be on the safe side. And so it's presenting like this in Singapore. And rather than having my output of no, and I do this with Roehampton students, they say you can't just say no, you have to say, Oh, that's an interesting answer, or well done, thank you for trying. <laughs> or something like very affirming. But I did a demo like this in Singapore. The teacher there in their version of the program said, instead of no, they had why are you so stupid. <laughs> 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 it's positive and affirming stuff. We're kind of out of time. Um, I put far too many slides into the deck here. Let me just you know, show you the other stuff very quickly. I'm not going to demo anything else. So we have a whole chapter there on how computers work. We get into the binary arithmetic. One maths teacher in the room. Teach them to do long multiplication in binary. Learning your times tables in binary is easy. One times one equals one. And that's it, okay. Long division in binary is incredibly easy. It goes or it doesn't go. That's kind of the point with binary, isn't it? Okay, we get into ASCII and Unicode, but we start with Morse code. And Morse code is really nice because Morse code was meant to be efficient. ASCII and Unicode take the same, no, ASCII takes the same number of bits for any character. Unicode kind of says common letters will use shorter word lengths, longer, um, Less common characters will use longer. But as but Morse code, way, way back, E, the most common letter, the shortest possible Morse code transmission. It's a binary system. It's either on or off, but it's not a bit-based system. We get into how images are represented. This is, of course, Countess Ada Lovelace, just as a bit as, as two values. It's either white or it's black, and we can use tools like Photoshop or Pixel R to take any image and start mucking around with the number of bits per pixel and the uh, resolution of the image. You can do a similar thing with sound. And again, using something like Audacity, zoom in on that, see the different levels. 65,000 levels, 48,000 samples per second to produce CD quality music. We look at logic gates, we start with electrical circuits. One of these is an AND, one of these is an OR. Hands up, which, no. which is the AND, please? Bottom one. Both have to be completed. The top one is the OR. And then we get into how they work. We've got a lovely tool called Logically, which lets us simulate logic circuits on screen. So this is a half adder. Um, one and zero is one. 
one and one is 10, and one and one and one is 11 in binary sort of thing. Um, logically is nice. Uh, we look at computer systems, input, process, storage, output. We think of things that do that. The micro bit is a great way of illustrating that. Again, micro bit code, both in blocks and in text using Nicholas Tolliver's micro Python. We look at computer networks. That was what the internet looked like in 1969. It is larger than that now. But it's easy to explain the internet using the 1969 diagram of the whole internet. But this is about connections. It's about connecting machines together. The web is the, about connecting pages together. The hyperlink is the thing that makes the web interesting and useful. And of course, it's the hyperlink which Google uses. That question about how does Google work? Well, it's the number and quality of inbound links. Page B is top of our results because loads of other pages, including high quality pages, link to it. Page C is second from the top. Not because loads of pages link to it, because the top quality page, page B, links to it. We talk about productivity and creativity. We talk about digital making, Oliver Quinlan's list. I'd add to that the good old-fashioned stuff about word processing and desktop publishing and presentations. We talk about principles of design, D to Ram's work, government digital services work. Do less. Start with the user's needs. And we do some data analysis, so looking at weather data and how that changes over time. We also conclude with a chapter on online safety and online responsibility. Tanya Byron's list from 2006. Kohlberg's notion of moral development, just following the rules. Yeah, you want children to do that in school. Following the rules is important, but that's not the end point of their development as morally responsible individuals, thinking about why we have those rules, how, what rules should be followed. Privacy and security. You have in your houses, I hope, both curtains and doors. They serve different purposes. Yeah, The curtains are about privacy. The door is about security kind of want both of those, and what's the equivalent of that in online space? We talk about cryptography in both of those contexts, um, and we have code to illustrate that, and we talk about identity. We're having a chat over coffee um, at the break time about you know children who don't realize how important their password is, yeah? And you have, you know, I've seen school cyber, uh, what is it, online safety policies, which says don't share your password with anybody except your parents. Don't share your password with your parents. If you allow parents into the school network pretending to be children, make sure you've got full DBS clearance of every child's parent there, yeah? That's a really bad idea. I don't know, we don't generally in this profession say, I'm going to tell you a secret, but don't tell your parents, because that kind of brings warning bells, but the password is the one which you keep to yourself. You know, it's like your toothbrush. Change it often and keep it to yourself, really. And the whole, you know, include loads and loads of ridiculous characters in there so you can never remember what it is. Don't do that. Four words picked at random from the dictionary. Far, far more secure than eight randomly chosen characters and significantly easier to remember. Whatever you do, do not choose those four words to be correct battery horse staple. No, correct horse battery staple because everybody knows the cartoon there. I'm sorry I've overran again. Um, take it away. See what you think. See how relevant it is to your line of work here. How much of this applies to what you're trying to do in school? I said, is, is there stuff in here which is new for you? And yet, if you're working in C sharp, I'm really sorry. Yeah, C sharp. I'm really sorry that all of the illustrative examples are written in Python. But make that transition. You know, somebody could do that actually. Use the Northern Ireland version where you take the Python code and convert it into C sharp. That would be very nice. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.